Neuroendocrine tumors are a category of tumors that uh, arise in different parts of the body from neuroendocrine cells. These are glandular cells, and instead of being aggregated in one lump like a, a gland, an organ, they are scattered, sprinkled about in different parts of the body. The most common kind of neuroendocrine tumor is the carcinoid tumor that starts in the small intestine, often makes serotonin, makes carcinoid syndrome, and spreads in the liver, spreads in the abdomen, and has certain features that we think about when we think about carcinoid tumors. The lung has about 28 percent of all carcinoids. The uh, gastrointestinal tract and the organs attached to it, like the pancreas, make up almost all of the remainder of the cases. Three quarters of all neuroendocrine tumors are carcinoid. One quarter are non-carcinoid neuroendocrine tumors, such as gastrinomas, insulinomas, vipomas, glucagonomas, etc. I try to teach patients how tumors grow. One cell becomes two cells. Two cells become four cells four cells become eight cells. The amount of time is individual between each patient. Some people have very rapidly grown tumors, some have very slow growing tumors. They are cancers. They don't all fulfill their malignant potential, but they have that possible uh, outcome. These tumors are, quote, functional, end quote, and the word functional means that they make something that causes a syndrome or a symptom complex. Carcinoid syndrome is a group of symptoms and findings in these patients who have carcinoid tumors that are producing excessive amounts of certain hormones, including serotonin. This only comprises uh, less than 40% of all carcinoid cases. It's possible to have a rather severe watery diarrhea, which can um, certainly be a problem, and also can have uh, facial flushing. The diarrhea can sometimes be so severe that it can uh, limit people's uh, social functioning and um, make people always worry about where the nearest bathroom is, and intense flushing of the face and social situations can also be very embarrassing or inappropriate, and in addition, uncontrolled carcinoid syndrome can lead to heart disease and other complications. And you usually will have elevated blood serotonin levels, urine 5-hydroxyindolacetic acid levels, that's known as 5-HIAA, and also elevated chromogranin A levels. Nowadays, we also see elevated pancreastatin blood levels in most cases. The quality of life issues are affected by, do you have diarrhea? Can we control your diarrhea? Uh, can, do you have flushing? Uh, can we control that flushing? Uh, do you have wheezing? Do you have asthma-like spells? Do you have hypertension that, that's uncontrollable? They also can be tremendously improved by using so-called somatostatin analogs like octreotide. There also are anti-diarrhea medications. There are um, anti-serotonin medications. There's even an app for the iPhone that will tell you where every public bathroom in America is. So for uh, <laughs> people that uh, are um, in need of that sort of information, it's right at your fingertips also. There is no one approved cure other than surgery, and that's only useful if the entire tumor can be removed. When I first see a patient who has a carcinoid tumor, neuroendocrine tumor, I reassure them that even in the setting of metastatic disease, that a long and quality life is still possible with proper treatment, and I guide them through the treatment process, and that I'm here to work with them and help them uh, get the type of care they need. They need to be educated on what to look for as symptoms, how, how to know that your doctor is appropriately working you up, diagnosing you, and then following you up, and what to do when 
things start to go wrong. But if somebody's diagnosed with cancer, immediately they just figure they have one foot in the grave and one on a banana peel and they're about to die. If in trouble, if in doubt, run in circles, scream and shout. Don't do that. Relax, there are treatments available for you. Learn more about your disease. Be sure that you're in the hands of a knowledgeable physician who has experience in this field. Read, educate yourself, and be open to new innovative ideas. If you read the, the textbooks from 1950, you will be sadly, sadly, sadly dead. My advice to carcinoid patients, caregivers, their family, uh, relatives, or friends, is to help the patient learn as much as possible about their condition and also be in touch with the local carcinoid support group. You need their friends, somebody who can offer emotional, social type of support from outside of the family. And we really don't know how long any individual person could live. There are certainly plenty of people that uh, have been treating their cancer for five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, even 40 years sometimes, and still uh, living with cancer. So I think that there's enormous hope, and we have to think of it not as a imminently fatal disease, but as a chronic condition. Without proper treatment, it can um, certainly shorten people's life a lot, and it is a cancer, and it has to be treated uh, with a certain amount of respect. During the time I've been involved with uh, net patients and carcinoids, I've seen the introduction and development of octreotide and lanreotide. There's a whole new generation of new somatostatin analogs and new medications for controlling symptoms of carcinoid syndrome. We have scans like Octrea scans that take a somatostatin type of derivative, somatostatin being a peptide that we make all the time in our brain and our body naturally, and they took and make a, make a chemical analog or look-alike and then hook radioactivity to it. And that goes, is injected intravenously, goes from the top of your head to the bottom of your toes and everywhere else, and sticks only to those things that overexpress somatostatin receptors, like a neuroendocrine tumor. I think that the concept of uh, personalized uh, medicine and targeted treatment is just in its infancy. And I think we're going to see um, genetic analyses of the mutations in cells and ability to treat the cancers with targeted therapies aimed at uh, specific targets that we know are driving the cancer cell to divide, to make it not divide so much. We have ways of killing cancer that are targeted specifically for that individual cancer and the particular mutations that are in the individual. But we've always assumed that you could take one biopsy of one tumor and it would represent all the tumors in your body. And what we're finding is that's just not true. Not subjecting people to potentially toxic treatments when they might not work is the goal that treatment should be relatively less toxic and more effective. I'm almost going on 40 years. Uh, and I look at, at how things have progressed in 40 years. I, I couldn't have begun to, to imagine where we would be 40 years ago. I think we're going to see more drugs. We may see more biological forms of treatment. Uh, the, there are uh, a number of things on the drawing board that are now being studied. I think it's just a beautiful thing just to see patients live and grow and develop and have a life even after being diagnosed with cancer. And the longer you are in this field, the longer you are able to see the fruits of your labor, so to speak, see people you have treated years ago who are still doing just wonderfully, even with metastatic cancer. And I think that's a real inspiration to me and I think should be an inspiration to other patients.